just waiting for everybody to get on here and uh, make sure my camera doesn't fall over. And we are going to talk about one of the keys to success in dog training, something that a lot of people lack, both, um, in my opinion, new people and also professionals when it comes to training dogs. So uh, I think this will be a, a, an interesting topic. And of course, as usual, your questions, uh, elite members, you know, if we get some super chats, I'll answer those. Uh, just have a good time talking dogs, as usual, on Friday nights. Damn, those are good. Philippines. Man, there's a lot of you guys in the Philippines. Someone just asked if I'm hiring trainers. Uh, I mean, you hit me up on email. It depends what you mean by a trainer. If it means somebody who wants to learn how to train dogs, um, we have a, uh, you know, we have an apprenticeship program uh, that we've, we're going through applicants for right now. Uh, we're going to be taking on a number of apprentices um, for the summer and then into the fall. Um, Kennel Techs, we did have a Kennel Tech job call out. It may be filled, it may not be. Either way, send us your resume. If you're the kind of individual we're looking for, even if we don't hire you on this run, we might hire you on the next one. Um, and then in terms of experienced dog trainers, if you're an experienced dog trainer, by our standards, yes, we are hiring. But, uh, you know, we're always hiring to some degree when it comes to that. Uh, but you have to meet certain very strict standards for us to consider you a actual dog trainer. Because that, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yes, decoy classes. <laughs> the chomped finger. So for decoy classes, yes, we are going to have um, an evening where, or maybe not an evening, I don't know. Something, there's going to be a day or an evening when, you know, we're going to dedicate a few hours to training people how to decoy. Uh, I just haven't figured the day yet, because to be honest, for me, it would be more of a weekday kind of deal, but I'm not sure if people are available in the weekdays. So we're going to have to experiment and look into it. I'm thinking like maybe like a Tuesday uh, late afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. I'm not quite sure. There will be a tracking course, yes, um, but that's not going to be for a while. There's a lot of other things that are on my schedule right now. I'm going to wait for a lot of people to get on here before I get into the topic of the day or the night. Sorry, guys, I'm just going through all the comments. Uh, we're not going to have technical difficulties, Brittany. <laughs> this time I charged my phone and I'm sitting really close to the Wi-Fi. So unless there's a storm or something, we should be good. Sorry about the drama the other day on the group. Yeah, I mean, there's always a little drama. It's what happens when you get a whole bunch of people together. The more people that come together, you know... Uh, the more drama there's going to be. Nicole, hi. Hi, Nicole. Q puppy litter, Q litter puppies born yet? No, they're not born yet. Uh, they're due first week of July. What do I think about Nepopo? I think it's a good system. Um, you know, it's a good system. It's a good training system. But... Like any other training system, there are people that practice it that are good, and there are people that practice it that maybe aren't so good. Um, 
It's also a bit of a gimmick, not in that the system itself is a gimmick. If you follow the system, uh, I think you'll have a lot of success if you're a competent trainer. But I think there are a lot of trainers that, you know, they go through the school or whatever, and all of a sudden they're doing seminars. They've never stepped foot on the field. They've never really tested their training beyond, you know, playing with their Malwa in a field with an e-collar and a ball. And it's like you can make some pretty slick stuff doing that. But unless you've actually said, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop with the trick training, because basically that's what that is. I'm going to take away the aids, and I'm going to actually proof this work, and I'm going to make it work on a competition field. I'm going to make it work, um, you know, in real life, if that's what you're training for. For me, it's like, okay, why are you running seminars? That's just, that's just my opinion. I'm looking for an adventure companion that's easy to live with. My wife is looking for a dog who can protect the home. What questions should I be asking her to make sure she knows what she wants? I would ask, number one, how much she wants to spend um, with the dog. Uh, how much time she wants to spend with the dog. Uh, how much work she wants to put in on a daily basis. How social she wants the dog to be. Like, what, what does she envision her life? Yes. The dog's a protection dog, but do you want to go to Starbucks with the dog and have the dog off leash with you? Do you want the maid to be able to come in the house? You know, uh, does your kid, do you have like small kids and do they have lots of small kid friends and do you expect the dog to be part of that whole scene? These are questions you need to ask yourself, you know, before you decide on a dog. These are questions I always ask people. Do you already have a dog? What, what breed is it? What sex is it? Do you have a cat? You know, the, the answers to these questions will determine the type of dog that you can have. I've been training around 10 years, six years as a business. I kind of consider myself a dog trainer now, a lot to learn. Well, there's a lot to learn for everybody, me included. The question is, and the question always is, we all have a different standard and that's the that's the problem with dog training. You know, some people say, yeah, I'm a dog trainer. And then I'm like, okay, show me something. And the way that they're doing it is just so ass backwards, in my opinion. Or, you know, their standard of being able to get to my, like they can't get to my standard, for instance, where I would say, yeah, that dog is trained. Their version of trained is a very different thing than my version of trained. So I don't know, obviously I don't know you, so I can't say what you're doing, but you know, hey, you know, you if you're the dogs speak for themselves at the end of the day. Nicole, I want to do your apprenticeship. I had emailed wondering if I could do weekends or break up the hours because I'm working. I'm coming from Woodstock. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can do all of those things. How can I stop my five month month old staffy showing so much interest in other people on walks? Make yourself more interesting, my friend. Make yourself more interesting. And stop allowing your dog to self-satisfy with other people. That's the short answer. Just going through all of this. Uh, my neighbor's dog vomits uh, multiple times a day from barking too much, eating too much, playing too much. Okay. No, I've never seen that before. Maybe stop letting the dog eat so much. Saw your video from the Detection and Decoy Seminar. Are you going to do more scent work with your dogs? Um, well, right now I'm training for IGP and I don't really have time to fool around with scent detection. So that's not going to be something I'm pursuing right now. Uh, maybe in the future, you know, maybe in the future we'll, we'll do that. I mean, scent detection seems like, like fun. Um, would you be interested in providing dogs and handler courses to South America? Um, well, it would depend what, what's entailed, man. You know, like I got a lot of people always call, you know, contacting us from different countries and be like, hey, I'd like to come to Canada and train with you. And I'm always like, great, well, get here and hit me up. <laughs> and they want me to kind of do all the immigration. It's like, bro, I don't deal with immigration. I have nothing to do with immigration. All right. Like I don't deal with them. I don't know anything about it. You got to get into Canada um, and then, you know, I'll happily work with you now if it comes to you know hey you want to fly me out and you know have me do something over there sure you know that's that's possible um but i don't deal with immigration <laughs> any tips or things you do to keep dogs cool in hot weather you know what i do in hot weather 
Um, what I do in hot weather is this. I have a side-by-side, -side and I have crates in the back of that side-by-side. -side. My dog, Gage, my personal dog, he sits out in those crates every day. Whenever I'm training, he's out there all day long. 38 degrees, 40 degrees, he's out there. Yes, I give him water, but you know what? He's out there in the heat. I don't keep him in the AC. So when I pull him out to train, you know, he isn't dying because it's not the first, he's not coming from a nice cool AC into, you know, intense heat. That's not what he's doing, right? So he's already acclimated. We go out there, we do, of course, an appropriate amount of training for the weather and, and whatever else is going on. And then I put him inside. So that's how I deal with the heat. You know, it's, it's not speci special things. I actually let them acclimate. If you think about it, we got dogs working in theaters where it's like 100 degrees, right, on the regular. Dogs in Afghanistan, dogs in Iraq. You know how horrendous it is in Iraq? <laughs> I know. I get, my, my, half my family's from there. It is a nasty, nasty heat. They got dogs working there. You got dogs working in, in Africa, right? Like, it's just acclimation. You just acclimate the dog. If you intend to work your dog in the heat, put your dog outside. My working dogs that I'm working, they go out, out into outdoor runs in the winter time, sorry, in the summertime because I want them fully acclimated and I want them able to, you know, work in that heat. So they're in the heat a lot. Okay. Watching while I ride and train my horse. Wow. You must be a pretty good horse rider and trainer. I could certainly not watch YouTube while I rode my horse. Um, okay. Let's see here if there's anything. Do I know Richard Hines? No, I don't. Uh, can you buy those hats? You know what? So we hired a guy to do, to do up the website and to do all the... Um, uh, uh, we're, we're, we have like an online store that's coming up. Don't ask me when it's coming up because every time I say when it's coming up, it doesn't come up. It was actually supposed to be up last week, but it's not. Don't ask me when it's coming up. This guy that we hired is doing all the the stuff for the, the we're going to sell the hats, the shirts, the sweaters, all the equipment that I use in my training, like the ball, the vest, the magnets, uh, the prong collars, the e-collars, everything is going to be available, uh, but it's not ready to go yet. I'm waiting for um, things to, to get together here. Uh, okay, just quickly going through some stuff here and then I'm gonna get to the, okay guys. So let's, uh, let's get into uh, uh, the discussion of the day. So for me, I wanna talk about the key to success with dog training. And I think this is a thing that's overlooked, right? And, what it is, is intention. I know you guys will be like, what, what are you talking about? What treats do you use, Has I saw somebody ask me that question. The treats I use don't matter because I don't use special treats. You know what I use? Kibble, <laughs> what the dog eats every day. That's what he works for. I don't give him food in a bowl if I'm training him. So the, he becomes motivated. You don't have to play, oh, you know, I hope he likes these treats. Oh, let me try those treats. Let me try. Use, use things that the dog values, right? If you want to reward the dog, find something he values and then reward him with it, right? Um, I don't play like, oh, I'll try these treats or those treats or I don't do that. Um, all my dogs work for their food. If I'm training them, my personal dogs. And then for the pet dogs that we get in here, uh, most of them will work for kibble too. Um, I like Royal Cannon in case you're wondering. Um, so that's what we generally use. If the dog won't work for the kibble, you know, and kind of, generally if the dog won't work for kibble, I kind of find that they're very half-assed with the treats. Like they'll kind of, you know, do that kind of slow chew. And for me, that's not a dog that I'm going to bother to uh, really train so much with food, right? I'll use more toys and praise for that type of dog. Um, the only time I get into playing games with food with dogs that are low food drive, generally it's when I'm training for sport. Give me a second here. Um, but yeah, there's no specific treat. So anyways, yes, that brings me back to the discussion at hand. What is the key to success in dog training? It's intention. Train with intention. Manage and handle your dog with intention. 
There are so many people that don't do that because they're thinking about what kind of treats that they should be using or what kind of e-collar they should have on or what kind of collar they should have on. Or, you know, they're obsessed with devices. They're obsessed with kind of like cheat codes or hacks. Intention, guys. Intention. Train with intention. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not just kind of trying to like give you some, you know, voodoo or something like that. I'm not, I'm not saying it like that. Um, it, what is intention? Intention is you have an intention in your mind of an outcome that you're desiring, whether it's in a training session or whether it's just how you go about your day with your dog. There is an intention there. This is how I expect things to go. When I do X, Y is going to happen, right? This is what I want out of this training session. Training with intention. What, how do you manufacture intention? It's not just magic where you say, okay, I, I want my dog to not be aggressive anymore. And then he's not aggressive anymore. No, it's preparation, right? So you prepared, it's preparation, it's practice, right? You, you understand what's going to happen. You have a plan, right? And then you have the will to follow through with that, right? Most people that I see that struggle with training their dog, right? Or managing their dog's behaviors, they have no intention behind what they do. And what I mean by that is they just kind of sit back and hope good things happen. And when bad things happen, they don't react. I've seen it so many times, you know, handlers walking around and their dog's losing its mind and they've already been shown what to do. They know what to do. They've been given the tools. The dog loses its mind and the handler just stands there like a useless lump on the log, letting the dog lose its mind. What are you doing? There's, do you want your dog to stop doing this? Train with intention. Manage your dog with intention. I do not want this behavior. I know what to do when he does this behavior. When he does this behavior, I do this. The behavior is simply not allowed. I will no longer tolerate this behavior in our lives together. That's an example of training with intention. I need my dog to track tighter in corners. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's my five-step plan to fix those corners, right? I'm going to follow that plan day in and day out. I'm not just going to show up to the trial and say, I hope he, I hope he turns the corner on the track. No, I have a plan. Will the plan always work? Maybe not. But if you train with intention, you have a 99% higher chance of success than if you do not, right? There's so many people. They just, I'll give you an example. So today, I took my new dog, Yaxi, engaged. I took him swimming today. So I went out to the quarry. There's a nice quarry close to here. We went swimming. First time I had those dogs kind of semi together, right? Two males, right? I know Gage will fight another male if, if things, you know, get down to it. But I said, you know what? I got my tools on the dogs. I have a plan if they go at it. I know what I'm going to do. And I plan to go and have a nice day or a nice hour at the quarry. And so I did. Right? I knew what to do if something went south. I had a plan. It wasn't that I was not, I was expecting things to just magically go well. But I had a plan. And then I had an intention. And I said, I said, this is going to be a good good session. We're going to go out there and we're just going to enjoy the, the water. And the dogs are kind of going to get to know each other a little bit. That's what's going to happen. And if, if anything goes down, if anybody acts up, daddy is not going to put up with that shit. And believe me, the dogs read that loud and clear. There were a few like moments where if you didn't do the right thing, for sure, something may have happened. But I did the, but I did the right thing because I was ready for it. I expected it. And I knew what to do, right? So it's just that simple. It's, it's one of those things. Intention. Intention is so important. And so many people lack it just in life in general, okay? but in their training as well. The best trainings I've always had is when I went into it with intention, whether it's behavior case, competition, um, you know, just regular pet obedience, whatever it is, when you have the intention of what you want and you know how you're going to get there, then that's it. You're going to be successful, right? But so many people, they, they've been given the tools. They know what to do or they should know what to do and they still lack that intention because what are they doing? Well, I hope my treats work. I hope my leash works. 
I hope my e-collar works. They're relying on devices. There's no intention behind anything they do. The dog reads that. Believe me, they do, right? The reason I put the picture, you guys, I don't know if you guys saw the picture, um, the title picture for this video. It's Kelly, okay, my friend Kelly Reedman, working my dog Gage. One thing I like about Kelly is every time he trains, he trains with intention, right? Whenever he does um, decoy work for my dog, he does it with intention. There's a plan. We know what we're going to fucking do, and we do it, right? And he knows what he wants out of the dog, and the dog reads that. The dog reads that because he's able to communicate with the dog what he wants, right? And again, it's not magic. It's experience. It's preparation, right? And all those things come together, and there's intention. The dog picks up on that intention real quick, and usually, the vast majority of the time, the outcome is desirable, right? He's a guy that trains with intention, so I like, that's why I put him on there. I don't know if he's going to see this. <laughs> Goal for the live. Keep the cigar alive. I know. I talk too much. Brought it back to life there a little bit. Uh, someone was talking in another dog trainer seem earlier about using verbal punishment, but it wasn't working. I don't know why they think talking to the dog would fix anything. Well, I'll tell you what. There's always cookies and hope, right? There's always those people. They have no intention behind anything they do. They just have hope. They hope the hot dogs work, right? There's no intention. Uh, I've watched quite a few videos on this platform, but don't often see much about muzzles. What do you recommend for a German Shepherd? Depends what you're doing. You're doing agitation work, then you get yourself a nice leather agitation mother, uh, muzzle. Um, you know, if you're dealing with an aggressive dog, I don't actually use muzzles that much with the aggressive dogs, only sometimes. And usually, I don't really use it for training. It's more like I have to condition the dog to the muzzle so it can go to the vet and stuff like that. Generally, we don't use them that much, um, you know. But for sure, I have used them. Just a basket muzzle is, is generally quite sufficient. I have watched all your videos, and I was able to train my dog, and he is great. Thank you for that. No problem. What was that? Let me see here. When does doggy dust-ups go over the line into fighting? <laughs> Usually quite quickly. <laughs> you know, I'll give you an example. I ran my two males together today. Uh, I didn't allow any playing with each other because it's always arousal-based. Nine times out of ten. It's arousal or it's over a resource, right? None of them, I didn't allow any of them. They, they weren't allowed to pick up sticks. I didn't give them any toys. I didn't give them any food. Um, you know, I just had them together and I expected that uh, they would behave. And whenever I saw a situation where arousal began to occur, you know, even though it was maybe play-based, mm -mm -mm. immediately I knocked it off. Who would you say was your main mentor? I didn't have a mentor. There were many good trainers that, you know, I had a chance to learn from. I went and saw, you know, seminars. There was never a mentor for me. There was never a guy that I could call him with questions. You know, there wasn't that guy for me. You know, there were guys that helped me along the way in different, you know, brief moments. But, you know, I didn't learn under anybody. So there was no mentor. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Yeah, Yaxi and Gage together would have been an awesome video. Yeah, it would have been, but I didn't have anyone to hold the camera, and I had my hands full with the dogs. So, unfortunately, that's a video that maybe I'll do another one later on, but uh, it's one of those things, right? So I guess, guys, you know, like the big thing, No matter what you're doing, if you go out with your dog, you need to have an intention, right? Like if you have a dog with you and you're struggling with your dog's behavior, you need intention. You need to hold your dog to that expectation, right? 
So simple things like, okay, I'm going to take my dog, my, my, my dog for a walk and my dog's not going to be an idiot. Establish a basic plan. Don't just keep doing the same stuff that you've been doing. Right. And it shouldn't be hard to establish a plan. Right. And then hold your dog accountable to that expectation. You're not going to be an idiot. You're not going to embarrass me today. You're going to walk nicely. Right. You have a plan. You, you have an expectation. Don't rely on devices. I'm not saying don't use devices. I'm saying don't rely on the device to do the work for you. I'll give you an example. There was some lady in my elite members group, right? And she put her dog, I guess, on a pinch collar for the first time because she watched my course or whatever. And the dog's like just some soft Doberman. And, um, you know, the dog's reactive to bikes, right? Bikes go by, whoa, 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 whatever. And she's literally doing none of the things that I told her to do. And if she watched the course, which she said she did, and she would have to have to be in the group, um, she's doing none of the things that I told her to do. Um, and she's just there and she literally typed, you know, I was expecting the prong collar to, to just kind of correct her. The prong collar isn't a sentient being. It's not going to magically correct your dog. It's not going to magically fix your problem. You, the what the course does, what my course does, right, is it gives you a plan. It gives you a set, step one, step two, step three, what you should do, how you should create expectations and hold your dog accountable to those expectations with both positive and negative consequences. And what she did was she slapped a device on her dog, threw her dog back into the situation where it failed constantly and expected the device to do something. There was no intention there. And naturally, the dog regardless of the device that he or she was wearing, went right back to the behavior that was undesirable. So I always laugh when people say, oh, that dog isn't trained. He's wearing a prong collar. He's wearing an e-collar. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, why don't you slap an e-collar or a prong collar on your dog and see how trained he or she magically becomes and then get back to me. These are training devices, okay? If you, if you don't know what you're doing with them, you will get nowhere with them. Um, was wondering your thoughts on a younger, higher drive dog being introduced into the home, bringing drive out of a lazy older dog? No, it's not, it's not going to happen. They don't bring drive out of the other dog. Uh, how do I deal with the German Shepherd losing his head when I leave him in the car and walk away? Well, um, you know, if it's an undesirable behavior, you must punish that behavior. Don't be an emotional coward, quote unknown. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Absolutely. There are too many of them. They like to outsource. These are the people I find that tend to get upset about how a dog was corrected versus the dog being corrected. Oh, I would never, I would never smack my dog. But you got a knee collar and a choke chain on your dog. What do you think those things do? And I've seen you use them, right? Why do you think what you're doing, that aversive that you're delivering with those devices, is any better than an aversive that you deliver with a part of your body? What makes one morally superior to the other, right? You've just outsourced the correction so you can feel better about it to a device. Now, I'm not saying go around smacking your dog. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are instances in which I see a lot of people outsourcing their training, their consequences, both positive and negative, to devices, to things like treats, so on and so forth, and wondering why it doesn't hold up, right? And, you know, I don't know. He wasn't being good today. He just didn't feel like eating his liver treats, right? Oh, he's only good with the e-collar on. These are people that relied on the device. There was no intention behind their training. There was no actual training right? Or, or meaningful training, I should say. And of course, it all falls apart when the crutch is gone. That's the difference between good dog training and using devices to slap a bandage on a problem, like throwing a halty on your dog because he pulls, right? Well, he doesn't pull with the halty on in some cases. In many cases, they still do. Yeah, but you didn't actually fix the pulling problem. <laughs> Didn't ash that one quick enough. Hmm. 
You're from Iraq. I'm not from Iraq. My daddy is from Iraq. I'm half Iraq. Well, technically, I'm half Kurdish, to be honest with you. I guess my people wouldn't appreciate being called Iraqis. Um, you're Muslim? <laughs> I am a man of God. Any good protection dog bre breeders and trainers in YSA? I don't know what that is, my friend. USA. Ah, well, there's many, many, many. What do I think about working Rottweilers? If you can find a good one, they're pretty serious dogs. One of the strongest dogs I ever sold was a male Rottweiler. He was one hell of a dog. One hell of a dog. The, the least fear I've ever seen in a dog. He wasn't like a clean biting dog. Like he would redirect on the face and stuff like that. But serious, serious dog. Do you think that drives are a natural thing? Or would you describe them first as motivation? And once they build that big desire connected to the motivation and they understand it becomes drive. No, true drive is inherent in the dog, right? You can manufacture things to some degree, but true die, true, true drive is inherent. Food drive, the drive to eat, for instance, inherent, right? Like there are some dogs literally from, from six weeks, they'll eat your hand off to, to take the food. You throw a hot dog over a cliff, they'll follow it, right? The same thing with the ball. It's not, it's not created, it's there or it's not, right? I throw the ball into the bushes and he's never seen that picture before. How long is he willing to search for it? How long does he run around looking for it and staring and uh, hunting around for it? If I throw him the ball, does he grab it and hold it and possess it? and, Or does he just, you know, half-heartedly mouth it and drop it? Oh, my dog's got crazy ball drive. And I say, oh, yeah, here, tell him to take the ball. And then they hold the ball. Oh, take the ball. And then the dog goes and, meh, meh, meh. <laughs> oh, well, he's distracted. <laughs> There's no distraction from drive. He either wants it or he doesn't. Now, I'm not saying you can't create the appearance that the dog has more drive and you can't do things to create more. So, for instance, when I have dogs that, let's say, lack food drive, there are things that I do to create more food drive, of course, not feeding them from a bowl. So we stop giving them free things and they learn to work for their food. But then the other thing is how you give the food. How do most people give the food? Here's your food. Here it is. And then the, the, the reward for the dog is to eat? No. For me with the dogs, especially the ones that have the lower food drive, they chase the food, right? I frustrate them. Like, oh, I want the food, I want the food, I want the food. And then when they put the work out that I want to see, and work doesn't mean obedience, just even chasing the food for me is work. They're showing, I, I create desire for the food. I actually make the food like prey. Right, chase it, chase it, chase it, chase it. And then he, he puts a little effort in and, oh, you got it. There's the food, buddy, right? The way that I deliver the food is more than just eating. It is the act, I, I create like a chase cycle with the food. And I, I create almost like a prey behavior in the dog. And then when he takes the food, he, he hammers the food. He bites me a little bit for it. That's when I know, when he bites the hand a little bit, that's when I know, okay, we're in a good place now with the food drive. Right? I don't like the dogs who just... <laughs> That's not food drive, you know? So there are things you can do to make food more rewarding for the dog. Right? And in my upcoming course um, for competition obedience, I actually have a module that I'm working on right now. Uh, building arousal. Um, building arousal, drive, and engagement. for, And it's going to show you how to man manufacture more food drive in the dog, um, maybe not more food drive, but more engagement for the food. Food drive is what it is, right? But you can make a dog with medium food drive outperform a dog with high food drive if you know how to manipulate the dog's desire and drive, right? So I get a lot of dogs that have, for instance, me and Carson's dog right now. Carson's got a dog from Europe. We, we imported them together, um, Yaxi and another dog. I still haven't introduced that dog. I probably should. He's a nice little dog. And um, his dog and my dog, both Yaxi and, and the other dog, they're more mediocre on the food drive front. But they both have extremely high prey drive. So when you bring the prey drive into the food delivery, all of a sudden you manufacture a much higher appearance in the food drive and there's much more engagement from the dog because the reward for him is not just eating, right? Now for dogs that don't have so much ball drive, right? And you're like, oh, like, you know, I want to make... 
I want to make it. Uh, uh, I want to make him have more food drive or more ball drive. Okay. Well, you can't make him have more ball drive, but what you can do is you can create a lot more frustration and engagement that culminates in him receiving the ball, right? So the it's not that the ball drive increases, but the what you do is you utilize, you know, the the inherent desire in the dog to play. Like for instance, there's a lot of dogs I find maybe they don't have the highest ball drive, the highest possession for the ball, but what they have is a lot of frustration. Well, let me manufacture a ton of frustration and let them have that outlet on the ball, right? All of a sudden, the ball becomes the dog appears to have really high ball drive, right? But really, he doesn't. But you can create more than what is naturally there. Now, if your game is, here's the ball, take the ball, well, then you're going to have what you're going to have. So there's a way to do everything, right? Building frustration, building desire, no more free shit, right? He doesn't have a basket of balls at home. The only time my dogs get toys are when me and them are playing with the toy. There is no like, you know, I'm talking about competition dogs. There, There is no, no like, oh, we're sharing or sorry, you know, you have your toys at home, but then I'm going to take the same toy out and hope that you're going to give me 110% on the field. We don't do any of that. Is it true Rottweilers are easier dogs compared to working line G and German Shepherds in a family setup? No. If you got a strong Rottweiler, they're certainly not easier than a German Shepherd. And the Rotties usually carry uh, dog aggression. Very common in the Rottweilers. Um, the strong working Rottweilers. Um, they're very, very common. And the not so strong ones. The dog aggression, especially from the males, is quite common. Um... And then uh, handler issues as well. If you're not a clear handler, uh, can be an issue as well with the strong dominant males. Do I have any experience with Bouvier? Yes, I do. I've worked a few of them. Yeah, they're nice family dogs for the most part. It's hard to get a good working one, but they're they're nice dogs to have. Had my dog Skipper in for a board and train. And you guys did a fantastic job. He's so much better in general. I'm happy to hear that, man. I'm very happy to hear that. I always like to hear dogs that we train doing well. Can guard dog training make dogs dangerous at home with the children? No. No, it doesn't make your dog dangerous with the child. Um, the fundamental temperament of the dog is really generally what determines how good they are around kids or not. Do you agree with sticking mostly with food rewards for sport dogs in the beginning to get lower arousal and therefore more reps and clarity? Yeah, generally, I always start with food. Why my dog doesn't like his uh, Kong, but he likes his tennis ball. Well, some dogs have preferences, my friend. Is CGC a good starter test for where you are in training? No, it's not a test at all. The the For me, CDC, <laughs> CGC, I should say, canine good citizen is like, does he have a heartbeat? Um, uh... I need experienced helper decoys. Is it worth the money to join a club? If so, what do you believe is a reasonable price? Depends on the dog. Depends on the club, right? For me, I'm a private sessions kind of guy. When you're in a club, um, I don't like clubs because not that I have a problem with them. It's just uh, for me, the problem with clubs is you're now obligated to all this, the, the, the events and things that the, the club throws. And on like the training day, you've got to stay there the whole time, right? So oftentimes, you know, like the training day once a week is like an eight-hour endeavor. And really, you only work your dog 15, 20 minutes max. You know, if you're lucky, you get two sessions in. It's like, I don't, I don't have eight hours of a day to burn like that. So it's not my deal. And oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of dogs in the club that maybe aren't doing anything productive, but they're taking up time. And it's a whole social thing. And, it, you know, I get it, why people do it. It's just not for me.
Is anxiety and dependency bred or is it bad handling? It's usually bad handling, but there are certainly dogs that are more prone to anxiety and, uh, you know, have issues when the handler's not present, uh, uh, a.k.a. separation anxiety. A lot of that is also early rearing, uh, you know, for me. My puppies are crate trained very early. They learn that they sleep separately from me. They spend a lot of time away from me, um, you know, and that's why they don't cry when I'm not home because from day one, they're used to being in a crate by themselves, um, you know, for, for, for hours at a time. Um, you know, they're not always, you know, at the, vel the term Velcro dog is like the stupidest term. Yes, every, just about any dog will follow you around if you let them. They're inherently social creatures, especially when they're young. They're very dependent. They can be, they're naturally very dependent on whoever their caretaker is. So if you allow it, that dog will never go anywhere without, you know, the dog will follow you to the bathroom. It's not special. It's simply just the way most dogs are. Um, but if you never teach that puppy to be by himself, and then all of a sudden you, you know, COVID's over, got to go back to work. Oh no, he's got separation anxiety. Of course, <clears throat> you never showed him how to be by himself. best mastiff for family pet there is no best mastiff um what there is is good dogs and bad dogs and whatever breed you're looking at whether it's a kenna corso a Presa canario a neapolitan whatever a borble go and make your selections carefully and and, and find a breeder that's producing the dogs that uh, you want to live with are dual purpose dogs allowed in canada yes they are what is your process for training guard to handler? <laughs> this is alive, my friend. There is no, I'm not gonna go through all of that. It's not, not the situ, not the, the 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 setting for that. I have a working line German Shepherd who is super leash reactive to dogs who refuses to be distracted by treat or ball. Again, relying on things, right? Uh, is there something else I should be doing? Yes, take my reactive course. It'll tell you what else you should be doing. Um. My owner is so much better after watching your videos. Oh, this is a person. <laughs> I'm glad your Ridgeback's doing well. First working protection dog. Malwa, German Shepherd, Dutch Shepherd. German Shepherd's always the best way to go. Easiest. What are Gage's faults, in my opinion? Too much nerve. Too much nerve in the dog. Can cause a little bit problems. Cause a bit, a, also, the genetic grips aren't the best. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on the grips to try and um, create a calm grip. But, you know, tons of work. And that's where, you know, kind of being more advanced as a handler comes in handy is, you know, things things where there's maybe a bit of a genetic shortfall. You can do things to, um, uh, let's say, make up for that shortfall or cover that shortfall. So I've done a lot of work. You know, on the grips, done stuff with Kelly on the grips. Um, you know, it's, it's, there are, there are, there are things that we've done to really, you know, make the grips better. But he's one of those dogs. It's not all, you know, there naturally. There's a lot of things. And I don't know how many dogs there is that everything is just naturally there. But, you know, I like him because he has enough drive and desire that, you know, with good training, you can achieve just about anything with him. How can I get my 11 month old Mel to see me as the person in charge? Be in charge, my friend. Develop some intention. And intention doesn't just come from your mind it comes from what did i say earlier preparation right develop a plan how am i going to train my dog cookies and hope e-collar what's my plan your plan better be more than devices and and and, and uh bribery right um I don't really need protection but teaching my dog to bark on command would be great for deterrent purposes do you address this in your protection training um, yeah, I mean, look, if, if, if I show the whole process, like how we, how we develop the dogs, both from a reactive side and the prey side, um, you know, if you don't want to take it to the biting, you can for sure avoid the biting though. In many cases, 
you know, it depends on the dog. If it's a prey dog, you're going to actually have to give it a bite to reward it for the barking. Otherwise, it's probably not going to be barking. Um, is certification recommended for success? No. Certification will not have any impact on your ability to train a dog. Certificates, your dog is your certificate, right? Um, all these questions, guys, like, oh, you know, my dog jumps on me. How do I make it stop? What did I say in the whole thing, right? Stop looking for magic. There is no magic. There's just good training. And then there's, you know, like I said, train with intention. There's no magic device. There's no, there's no, you know, uh, treats or ball or anything, right? Develop a plan. You can use all those things, but have it as part of a comprehensive training plan in which you are communicating effectively to the doc what is desirable and what is undesirable right i'm not going to give you magic there's no magic to give you right because even if i told you hey do xyz you probably still wouldn't be successful because there's no intention behind anything that you're doing it it's proven by the fact that your dog continues to jump on you right and and you haven't really been able to address the problem right for me I don't need a single tool. I don't need a single ball. I don't need anything to make a dog stop jumping on me. If I decide it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Intention, right? So it's one of those things. I'm not saying you have to be me. I'm saying develop a plan. Think about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And don't just develop a plan blindly like, you know, oh, I, 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 this is my plan. No, go and seek knowledge, right? And it's not something I can just tell you in a lie. Right, go and seek knowledge. But at the at the end of the day, right, whether you go to a professional trainer, whether you train with me online, whatever, whatever, think to yourself, why is my dog jumping on me? What is he getting out of it? Because he wouldn't be doing it if he didn't get something out of it. Right? So your dog's getting something out of jumping on you. How can I make it undesirable for him to jump on me? How can he pair the the act of jumping on me with, with a bad thing instead of a good thing? Because obviously if he's doing it. He's getting something out of it, right? And usually most dogs jump on the owner because they're so excited to see the owner. And, um, you know, this is how they kind of express that joy and stuff. And, of course, it's also fun to jump on things, right? You see dogs whenever they play with each other, they jump on each other. Today, my cigar, well, probably because it's not smoking, doesn't seem to be really uh, keeping the box at bay. Has, have you been happy with the litters of puppies that your program has produced? Some of them and some of them I have not. I recently retired a female I didn't like. I had two litters with her. I didn't like the working quality of either litter and I retired her. What is, if there is, the difference in picking a personal protection dog and a PSA competition dog? There's a huge difference. <laughs> it's like... Those are two very, those aren't necessarily the same thing, right? Those are not necessarily the same thing. What you want out of one isn't necessarily what you might want out of the other, or maybe it is. But generally speaking, you know, PSA is number one. It's, it's, it's offensive. It's not defensive. A protection dog is primarily a defensive and, and deterrent type thing, right? So the amount of reactive aggression and and defensive behavior you might want in a protection dog you probably wouldn't want in a psa dog right so it's it's one of that's the first thing that really jumps out at me also the level of prey drive that you want in a psa dog is probably not something the average home you know might be able to so easily live with right Would you say the internet and YouTube has made it more difficult for new dog trainers or easier? No, it's easy. If you have a mind to see, right? If you have common sense. When I was looking, like I told you guys, I had no mentor, right? So when I was looking for information, I spent hours and hours on the internet, right? YouTube was just becoming a thing when I really started the dog training thing. I still remember like the working dog forum, all these things. 
And it was, you know, people would talk their talk, but it was really easy to see if you had the eyes to see if someone knew what they were doing, right? So if you see someone and they're producing the kind of success or what you perceive as success with the dog, right? And they're showing their work. This is someone to pay attention to. This is someone to listen to, right? If their portfolio interests you, then you might be interested in what they have to say. Part of what made me, um, I think, a decent dog trainer was being able to objectively look at my dogs and then compare them to the other stuff that people were putting out and saying, like, is this better? Is it the same? Is it worse? And if it is, you know, what's what's the difference? What what am I doing wrong here? Or what am I doing right? Who sells hard ass working dogs in the US? I wouldn't say there's anyone that sells hard ass working dogs anywhere. There's good litters and there's bad litters. There's good breedings and there's bad breedings. And within a breeding, you'll have absolute warriors and then you'll have, you know, dogs that are really, for me, nothing more than a pet, right? So there's no like guarantees. I have a five month old male German Shepherd. He has tons of energy, food, and ball drive, but doesn't care about rags or tubs. I want him for my first IGP dog. Should I be concerned? Well, it's a little early. Sometimes the prey drive can come later. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lack of prey drive at five months is something now you, you, you've got to be aware of it and keep your eye on it. And, you know, hopefully uh, some prey comes in. Otherwise, it's going to be real hard for you. going through these questions guys all right what should i talk about now i think i got five more minutes here oh the, the dutchie video i knew that one would kind of oh what are you talking about i got all these great dutchies blah 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 um <laughs> you know uh, it's just one of those breeds. Like we train a lot of different breeds and there are certain breeds that always spell trouble. Okay. So chow chows are probably number one. There's literally one chow chow I've trained that was a good dog. Like the rest of them were just horrendous, horrendous dogs. Um, you know, chow chow, terrible dogs. Um, the Dutchies are, are number two. Like the vast majority of Dutchies that we see here are are just really not what i would think of as an ideal dog for the family they tend to have you know it tends to be challenging for new trainers or new new handlers to deal with them um there's just a lot of issues right and you could say it's probably because of the obviously most of the duchies we see here are bred locally so that's a huge part of it but I've listen. I've imported Dutchies. <laughs> I've I've seen good ones, and the good ones are even really tough for most people. So, you know that one stands. So Chow Chows and Dutchies for me, it's like if you're a family, if you're, you know, new to dogs, avoid those ones. Um, you know, other than that, you know, look. I know there's people they love their huskies. I got a trainer, Seema. She loves huskies. She actually has a couple huskies. She does the dog sledding. I see a lot of bad behavior with the Huskies, too. <laughs> I, I've seen good Huskies, but I've seen a lot of really bad Huskies, too. So, How do I deal with emotionally weak dogs? Um, well, you mean emotionally sensitive dogs right well what i do is i always make sure that i create i can create positive emotion if i can create positive emotion um we you know then i can bring the dog up if the dog goes down right 
That's the big thing. They tend to actually be a little bit, you know, easier in some ways to train as long as, um, you know, they're, they, you know, you're able to, to manufacture some positive emotion in the dog. That's like literally like almost every border collie in the world. What do I think about Akitas? Beautiful dogs. They tend to be stubborn. Um, it's like training a mule. Have I done it? Yes. Quite a few times, actually. Mals can have similar drives as Dutchies, but it's the big difference that the Dutchy breeding is generally worse. No. You know, I look, Mals are not a dog I would recommend for, for you know, first-time handlers either, but there's a lot. I don't know what it is. Again, locally, there's a lot of Mals that, um, you know, are uh, being bred that are very soft and, and, you know, they're a little bit nervy, but nothing too bad. And, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mouths I see now. There's a, there's a lot of mouths being bred for the pet market. It's not a good thing, but generally speaking, I don't see the same issues in the mouths that we see in the duchies. Why that is, I couldn't tell you. It's probably just the individuals that are being bred. <laughs> Do I like chihuahuas? I have a chihuahua. We got like a 15 year old chihuahua. I used to have two. Um, are American Bulldogs good for a family protector? Yeah, if you get a good one, they're badass. Staffies? Yeah, I've trained Staffies. I like Staffies. They tend to be very sensitive dogs. Uh, again, usually have dog-on-dog -dog issues. Very common, of course, considering the breed. Um, uh, high arousal around other dogs. Uh, they tend to be sensitive, but again, really low threshold for arousal. Then when they become aroused, then they're not so sensitive anymore. Um, so that's the challenge with them. Um, so you just have to know kind of how to manage them. Do I hunt? No, I've never, I, I well, I have hunted occasionally. Um, I have thought about training gun dogs, but it's just not something I have time for right now. I do find the whole gun dog training thing interesting. Problem is, I'm just not a big fan of wild birds, like eating them. I don't really want to eat wild birds, and I feel like in order to kill wild birds, you have to be willing to eat them, and I, I don't really want to eat wild duck. It's just not my thing. Um, Name some good, hard, high fight drive GSD trainers. John, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a thing. If you want like good decoys in the US, um, I mean, there's a lot of good decoys in the US. The, D, the, the US is going to become the center for working dogs as Europe slowly fades into the darkness that is the progressive animal rights movement. The U.S. is going to become the mecca for working dogs. We already see now a shift where people are purchasing working dogs from the United States. Um, you know, there's a lot of really talented decoys in the U.S. Again, I suggest you look at what people are doing and, you know, um, decide if that's, uh, that's, that's something for you, you know. Um, let me think of who I know down there personally. Diamond Hansel. He's a good, uh, really, really good trainer. Um, Marco Costanzalo's down there. You know, Ivan Balabanov's down there. There's a decoy in Florida, Carlos Ramirez. He really, I have never met him in person, but I know people that work with him and they speak highly of him. Um, so he looks like he knows what he's doing. Um, Justin Rigney's down there. Um... I think, again, I don't know him in person, but it seems like he knows what he's doing as well. Uh, my friend Mike goes down there, too, if you ever want to work with him. I think he does seminars all through the U.S., so he's he's down there, too. So there's a lot of people down there that, you know, are, are talented. I hear they're banning Belgian Malwas in Europe. Yeah, they will start to ban them because... When they ban the first step was to ban the training that you need in order to actually properly train those dogs. Then of course you can't train them, so they must be dangerous, right? So then you ban the dog itself. Uh, thanks for your training. I had Pepper in place on a picnic table. I have no problem, my friend. I'm glad you're doing well with Pepper, and there's no more reactivity. 
Would you come to the U.S. for seminars? Yeah, potentially. Of course, it has to make sense, right? All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in. It was a good life. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. And I'll see you all on the next one.